welcome to uh, today's show. It's going to be a fun one. Today we are talking about monetizing history. What is that about? Well, I have some ideas on it and I'm sure we'll have lots more ideas by the end of the show. I've got a ton of resources, tools, ideas I want to share with you guys. It kind of links into the white label concept I've been working on, the new blue sky create concepts we've been working on, but it really is a bit of everything. Whether you're dealing with merch at the moment, you're selling on merch, whether you're selling on create space, you're making coloring books, or whether you're selling on your own website and building your own brand of products, whether you're doing Kindle, eBooks, anything, this is for you. And bundlers, bundlers, you are going to love this too because it's creative, it's kind of fun, and hopefully it will give you a ton of ideas for new projects. Um, I've been researching this for the last few days and I just keep getting, like, I keep going down rabbit holes. I know Zuzu was posting earlier and she said, wow, there's just like, uh, what did you say, Zuzu? It was like, you, it's, it's a big distraction. It's like you just want to get your tea and sit and watch all the videos and look at all the links and just keep researching things. And I kind of feel like that. Like I, every, every step I take with this, I've been like, oh, I've got another idea. I've got another idea. So hopefully we can find some outlets for those ideas, come up with lots more, and there will be a huge abundance of product ideas for everyone. So first of all, is history boring? Like I, that, that, that's kind of been one of my problems, like with school and with history. I, when I hear dates, and I, I mean, coming from England, it was all kings and queens, and it was like, oh, well, this guy was on the throne for this long, and then he had four children, and then they have, and you're just like this by the end of it. Like history tends to get a bad rep for being boring, but history is pretty interesting when you think about it, because history is about people and people don't really change. Like people are nerdy about stuff. People have things they love doing, like um, dancing, eating, putting on makeup, wearing cool clothes, um, riding on bicycles or airplanes or boats. Like people don't really change. They travel, they have families, they have kids, they have babies. Yes, at some they used to die of plague and hopefully we have less plague now, but people still get sick, people need doctors. People uh, still have occupations, they're still teachers, they're still, I don't know, they, they're still businessmen or women, they're still uh, merchants and travellers. Like, people don't change that much. And this is what's kind of interesting about history, is that when you really start kind of poking around with it, you find that there's all this stuff that's actually really relevant to what's going on now, to what's trending at the moment, what's politically interesting at the moment, what's in the news. You can find these parallels in history. And if you do a search for history memes, um, I think it was trending on Facebook the other day, history memes, and it just had all these pictures of like photo memes, but applied to old historical events. And I, I thought that was really cool. You can get a lot of uh, pictures of like things that are going on now, but applied to old historical events. Let me show you, actually, what I can show you is this BuzzFeed list. Let me hit screen share and you'll see what I mean. Okay, so we go to this list. And this kind of gives you an idea of where we're going with history ideas. And these are some ways that other people have monetized history. This is one I, I shared, oh wait, there we go. These ones at the top, this is one I shared earlier in the event for this group. And this is Rosa Parks, Harriet Tubman, and Sojourner Truth. These are finger puppets. Like how cool is that? And you have to think about this, that people are doing homeschooling, it's huge right now. Homeschooling is a big, big thing. 1.7 million kids in the US are homeschooled right now. So things like this have a big audience built in. 
But if we scroll down, you'll see, okay, this guy is like history buff. This is a t-shirt for history buffs. But then you get into really cool stuff like this, a flash drive shaped like the Rosetta Stone. Now, Rosetta Stone's really interesting because it has all this symbolism. And symbolism is a big, big thing. The Rosetta Stone symbolizes translation, languages. So it can be applied to a lot of things. And this kind of idea of unlocking the Rosetta Stone, someone made it into a flash drive. <laughs> this travel mug that had Henry VIII's wives on it. Like it's kind of done, we usually see that like the Beatles star with John and Paul and George and Ringo. Someone did it with Henry VIII's wives. Greetings cards. Genghis Prawn. Um, and this, like, this is cool. The Constitution in earring form. Like, the Constitution is, is never going to get old. Like, people, uh, I mean, it's such a huge thing in American culture that you can use, like, the Constitution for all kinds of things. And, I mean, someone making earrings out of it is just genius. I can think of several people I know who would love that. And some of these are really, really clever. If you, uh, we scroll down a little bit, um, a King Tut bag, President socks, Marie Antoinette gag there, the Rosie the Riveter oil flask, and Hamilton the musical. Like, this is huge at the moment. History is still very, very relevant. And I like this, like terriers as historical figures. And that's something you can apply to anything, like take dogs or cats. And I, I know Marilyn Southmead did a lovely um, coloring book with penguins in different occupations. Like there was like a, a, an Egyptian one, and I think it was like a Viking. And I mean, you, you can kind of apply this idea to all sorts of things. So I'm just kind of giving you an idea here. And puns. Puns are huge. Isn't it ionic? Hey! <laughs> Gandhi saying, OMG, chill. And that's kind of like the, the history memes now, where you take a modern saying or a modern sort of like a current photograph or meme, and then you apply it to a historical figure or event. So lots and lots of ideas there. I'm not suggesting you rip off anyone's idea, copy anyone's idea, just kind of giving you a feel for what kind of things are out there as products that have been made with historical ideas on. And this was one I loved. This was actually a t-shirt that Think Geek put out, and you can't get it anymore, but I bought it for my daughter because it had Ada Lovelace on, who was basically thought of as the first female computer programmer. And I thought that was really cool because it has a lot of relevance today. Like there is still an issue of women and girls and how they fit into STEM, into the sciences, into technology. So actually by digging back a little bit, you find people like Ada Lovelace who are still very, very relevant. And this is what's like really cool at the moment. If you look at what's trending at the moment, I think she may have been, yes. She worked with Charles Babbage. I think, I think she may have been Lord Byron's daughter, but I don't know for sure, so um, that's Amy asking in the chat. But here's where you can really use history, is look at what's trending at the moment. Like, what are people concerned about at the moment? And there's a lot of things in the news. And I don't want to get sort of political and deep on this. And I'm, I'm sort of going to keep things very neutral. But if you look at movements that are big at the moment, you can really go back and find parallels in history. Like, it, it was interesting. I was looking at something called That Camp. And I'm going to show it to you actually quickly. But here's the Twitter for That Camp. And what's interesting here is that that camp is an unconference group. And what they do is they have gatherings around the US uh, and people have conferences, but they're, they're kind of impromptu. They just talk as they get together. And what's cool is they talk about subjects about the humanities and history. And looking at it, it was really interesting because they deal with a lot of current trends. So, for example, some of the, the topics I found them discussing were about queer spaces, making queer spaces in history. And there was another topic on Black Lives Matter and historical events that had like contributed towards that. 
So these are topics that are like really relevant, really pertinent now, and that people emotionally feel very strongly about. Now, if you look back in history, you can kind of find people and historical figures that could support your argument. For example, if you were trying to make products about queer spaces, for example, then go back and look at sort of people like Noel Coward or like people who had a lot of things to say around those topics or who were kind of figureheads of kind of like the the queer movement in history. That was something I wanted to share with you quickly. Cool. So let me switch back. Oh, and here's another store I wanted to show you quickly. Just a sort of another approach on how people are making products that are historical or have a historical influence. And this store is called the Philosopher's Guild. And it just has some awesome products in here. Um, You can get like anti-established mints. And bear in mind that puns are huge. If you can find puns or historical jokes, you can put them on anything. You can put them on candy, you can put them on t-shirts, on mugs, on all kinds of things. And I mean, Google historical jokes, historical puns, and it will get your brain thinking about some of the directions you can go with that. It has, and there are some cool things in here. I think I found, uh, let's see, there's the primordial soap, another pun thing. And I love these little finger puppets of like Michael Foucault. And if I look there, it has, it had a whole section on moustaches in here somewhere. Let me see if I can find the moustaches. Was it under most obscure? Everything's hiding from me today. Oh, there we go. Here we go. Moustaches. Okay, so they have like a Salvador Dali watch where his moustache spins around and around. They have all these products just about moustaches. And you know, this really got me thinking because I feel this whole beard and moustaches, hipster vibe that's around at the moment. A lot of that comes from sort of Victoriana and that sort of Victorian vibe with penny farthing bikes and just anything from the 1800s. There's like a real vibe of that going on at the moment. And you know what's awesome about that? All the pictures and photographs you can find from the 1800s are public domain. So you can take artwork from that era and you can use those pictures, those images, the the text, the concepts, and you can apply them to pretty much anything you can think of, whether it's like home decor, bedding, candles, soap, bath products. I mean, all you have to do is find like a pun or a funny idea and you can use those pieces of artwork, those kind of Victorian concepts and apply them to products today and probably have something quite original with them. So I did want to show you that website. This is called the Philosopher's Guild, the Unemployed Philosopher's Guild. So I'm going to move on a little bit. Let me see what I had. Oh yeah, I want to show you this resource as well, which I thought was really cool. If you want to do some research, havefunwithhistory.com is a really cool place to check out. And this kind of goes back to what I said about homeschooling. That people are really, really big on homeschooling at the moment. Like it is a big thing. People are looking for resources and they want things, they don't just want like packets. Like Isaac and I were sitting and brainstorming the other night and we were like, what could we make that's a homeschool product? Because it's really easy to just make word sh- worksheets. A worksheet, you can have a word search and there are word search generators out there. You can have trivia quizzes. I mean, you just pick a topic and you can create some worksheets very easily a dot dot, a a word search, a trivia quiz, a colouring page. You kind of have a packet there for elementary school. But what might be more cool is the things like the finger puppets. Kids like to get kind of hands on with history. So if you can come up with like, or maybe action figures or little dolls, something like that, you could actually have really powerful home school products. I don't know, have you guys got any ideas for what you would put in a home school packet to kind of like historically based? Like if you're gonna teach American history, like we were talking about Ellis Island, what would you do if you were gonna like teach the history of Ellis Island to elementary kids? Right, a craft set, that's awesome. Well, we thought another idea we had was um, little boats. Like what if you had like toy boats and figures that you could put, right, that's, Isaac's saying the toy boats 
I think there's a lot of very practical things you could do with this, either to create a bundle, a printed book. And as I said, I mean, if you use Create Space, imagine using Create Space and using like a word search generator, a crossword generator, make a really easy trivia quiz, make a coloring page. You could have a 20 page little homeschool book and really make a really nice packet about a particular topic. Oh, cool, Jordan says genealogy, have a passport or something like that for each kid and pretend like they're checking in. Awesome, so have role play kits. That's so, I love it, that's, that's such an awesome idea. Cool, so there's a lot of places you can go to research history, I love this. I mean, this has like, you've got the people timeline here so you can go and research specific people. And what I would really, really say here is think about people. And this is like the number one thing I want to say about history. History is, so my grandmother always said a thing. Whenever someone took photos, she says, photos are boring if they don't have people in it. <laughs> That's like a big thing she has. Photographs are boring if they don't have people in them. So this to me kind of applies to a lot of things like history. History is kind of boring when you just think about periods or the time periods. History gets interesting when you look at particular people. Think about like the movie Titanic. They had to make a story out of it. They had to have a story about people. So you had like Jack and Rose and their whole story. Even though they were kind of fictional people, we were more invested in it because we emotionally identified with the people. And this is a huge, huge thing with history. History is kind of all about heroes and villains. And what's kind of funny about this is that someone who may be a hero to some people may be considered a villain to others. Like, I, I don't know, you take Christopher Columbus. To some people, many people think he's a big hero. Other people, not so happy about him for political reasons or other reasons. So you can take historical figures and you can kind of identify with them in a way that makes sense to you as a modern person. I would consider using, like thinking about this. What do people stand for? What do historical figures stand for? Um, and what do they represent to modern people? Like what's our relationship to modern people? And that's why I think someone like Ada Lovelace is like a fantastic historical figure because right now there's a big trend for gender, positive toys, gender positive STEM learning, science, technology, education. It's, that is a huge trend right now. So presenting girls with someone they can really look up to or putting like her image on clothes or maybe on a computer case or something relevant like that. Huge, huge potential there. And I, I, I kind of want to touch on something that I, I, in, the, in the new course, I talk a lot about intersects. I say the way you create something is to find an intersect. Like how is this, how is one concept relevant to another concept? So for example, if I was going to private label or white label makeup uh, or a cosmetic range, what I would be doing is looking in history for something that was considered beautiful. And there are several directions I could go with that. I mean, I could go to like the flapper era, the 1920s and sort of red lipstick and the white skin and the, the, the big eye, the sort of really um, tight plucked eyebrows. And I could go to that era and I could find artwork, I could find images, and I could have flapper makeup. I don't know, what I'd probably do again, thinking about people is I would probably come up with like a fictional character or maybe look for a historical figure from the early 20s and use that as my character and my brand. So I, I don't know, Daisy the Flapper. And I would have Daisy the Flapper makeup with her picture on the front and then have colors that complement that concept. Or I could go and look at sort of like ancient Egypt and do like Cleopatra. Like Cleopatra was like a figure of beauty. People think of Cleopatra and they picture a very certain, uh, specific type of beauty. And that actually might fit into, particularly I like there, there are, she has kind of the, the, the link um, perhaps with darker skin. So Cleopatra might be like a great 
thing to put on um, makeup that was for people with darker skin colors. So you, you can kind of look at history and find people or concepts that are relevant today because that link is still beauty or glamour. Like if you're making makeup, you're, you're looking for examples of beauty or glamour from times gone past. And think, like here's, here's what I would suggest. When you are looking for products now, what I say is think about target audience, whether you're making coloring books, whether you're making bundles, whether you're making new white label products, the first thing you should be thinking about is target audience. But what's cool is once you have that target audience, you can go back in history, go back in time, and find things that that target audience can relate to. They may not have even heard of what you find. Like Molly's saying, the Lincoln beard brush, exactly. Beards are huge right now. Like people are big into beards. And it, it's funny because it was something we talked about at ASD. One lady said she had a brand of beard oil. And things that we, we kind of looked it up with Blue Sky and some of the things we found were things like Viking beard oil is a big, big thing. And I love Molly has Lincoln beard. I mean, like you, you can go back and find people with beards that would be great role models that you could use for those products. <laughs> Jordan has a great one there. He says his niche is all about scary stuff. He has his target audience in the bag. He sells products that people who like scary things like. So you go back and look at insane asylums, dungeons, witchcraft, like all of those kind of things. Like this is what's amazing. Like history is this huge, huge, huge gold mine of things. I mean, if you're making products for girls in science, I found a website actually called Women in Science. I can cut and paste that in. It's an ugly looking website, but it has some cool resources. Let me post it there. Here we go. There you go. There's um, 4,000 years of women in science, which I thought was really, really cool. It's, it's an ugly looking website, but it has some great biographies, lists of women, like just cool options you can have. Jordan's saying Ouija stuff, occult things. Yes. So I had something to show you actually, like this is cool. I want to show you this, you guys, this tool, because I think this is an epic, epic tool. When I found it, I was so excited and I've been looking for a chance to kind of show it to people. But this is part of Google Books and it's called the Ngram Viewer. And check this out. Oh, that's cool. Molly said, look at big fish games. And many of them are dark themed with asylum. So it's definitely a niche. What you could do is look up occult witchcraft. I'm doing this as an example. I'm going to show you guys something. Murder. Let's, let's pick some sort of dark topics. And what this does is it searches all the books that Google have archived and it finds how many times those things are mentioned, how often those things come up. And murder is, look at this, this is interesting. Murder has basically been a very popular topic since 1800. It kind of never went out of fashion. Witchcraft and the occult, they've both been talked about sort of fairly constantly. This tool is just amazing. So it's at books.google.com slash ngrams. And what it's doing is searching through books from the past to find mentions of these topics. Now, what's particularly cool here, and let, let me give you another example. So I think I mentioned dancing. Here's a search I did earlier. Let's say you were making dance bags for ballet dancers. And um, dancers are a big, big niche audience. There are dance stores everywhere, and there's lots of kids go to dance classes. Big, big target audience. So let's say you wanted to design a dance bag so let's go to Google Books and we'll look up ballet, Charleston, tango, um, search lots of books. And it's kind of interesting because we can see that ballet's always been around but got really popular in the 1930s, which is interesting. There was kind of a peak and then it really peaked in 1940. And so you can find this ballet. And what you can do here is we can go to, let's say, uh, 1854 to 1928 click there and it brings up a bunch of books wait those are about the charleston town actually let's just do ballet let's get rid of charleston tango and search lots of books 
Okay, so let's go back to 1870 to 1943. And what you find here is a lot of books about ballet. There's the, the Ballet Shoes, a children's book, and The Art of Ballet, 1915, The Art of Ballet. Okay, so let's see what The Art of Ballet has to say in 1915 takes a few moments just to let all the pictures load up but here's the thing everything pre-1923 pretty much everything there's a few exceptions but pretty much anything before 1923 is public domain so if we find images if we find pictures if we find text from 1915 such as this we could use these images on dance bags we could use these images on i don't know what what other has anyone got any other product ideas for what we could sell to a target audience that involved dancers i'm sure if we scroll down there's some more art in here see a list of illustrations so we know there's a lot of art in this book let me scroll through it quickly just a bit slow scrolling see if we can find some pictures there we go look at these pictures oh my gosh look at this picture here so you could put this on a music box you could put this t-shirts like you could colorize this. What I would consider doing is like getting someone on Fiverr perhaps to clean up this image and dye sublimation leggings. Yes, Molly, that is a fantastic idea. You can, you can sublimate leggings. And there's a lot of websites at the moment actually that have legging printing. So like take an image like this and colorize it. I'm pretty certain you could find someone on Fiverr that you could use to colorize an image like this and put it on leggings. Party supplies, awesome idea. Diana, I need to thank you. Diana sent me some of her awesome bundles. I received them this morning and I will be using them with the kids for Easter. So thank you so much, Diana. That was so, so sweet of you. Posters, yes, you could totally use this for posters. Like there are so, so many ideas you can go with for, like you find one or two pieces of art and you kind of like, you're finding something that's been kind of lost in history. And we've just, remember, we've just found this from going to books at Google. So I'm sure there's a lot more pictures in this book. I, it, it just takes a bit of scrolling to find them all. But lots and lots of options there. Kitchen stuff, coasters, yeah. A oh, Amazon Custom. That's an interesting beer. Beer says Amazon Custom. So you could probably, what, what I like Amazon Custom for, is actually looking for ideas for things that you could white label. Like Amazon Custom. So let me just explain Amazon Custom briefly. Basically, you can list blank, as a seller, you list blank products, and it can be anything. It can be like uh, wristbands or bracelets, posters, like plaques you can put on your desk, hanging signs, and then the buyer uploads an image, and the custom seller prints that image onto their product and sends it to the buyer. I think it's kind of a lot of work unless you already do have sublimation capacity, but you could actually use it for sourcing. Like if you are selling a product, you could actually talk to a custom maker or a custom seller and talk to them about perhaps doing a wholesale product with you. Like I would look at it, for, yeah, I, I agree with you, Pamela. I feel it's kind of, Custom's kind of a backward step if you're an FBA seller, because also you have to merchant fulfill the product. But I think you can use custom for sourcing, and I think that's a really powerful way to use it. I do think there's a bit of shiny object syndrome about handmade and custom, and merch, for that example. Like I, I think they're all a little bit shiny objects. How can we link to Printiful from Amazon Custom? I don't know, Rick. That's, I've never done that. I, I don't know if it's possible. It might be. And it might be possible to do it through Shopify. But I don't know what Printful, whether Printful have the capacity for linking. So I've never looked at that. Printful. Yeah, I, I, I know what you're talking about. But I, I don't know if they do link directly. So you, if someone might know. I know Shopify can link, but I, Jordan's saying Shopify can do it, but Printful, I don't know. So I'm going to go back just to, again, show you what, what tools I was using, how I did that. This is Google Books Ngram Viewer, and I looked up ballet, and then I just chose my book from here. I just want to give you guys a resource here. Here's the URL. Let me paste this into chat because you guys can keep this. This 
is a really boring looking page, but it is amazing, amazing tutorial right here. And it tells you what's copyright. So pretty much anything before 1923 is yours to do what you want with. Images, film, text, any of those things are pretty much yours to do what you want with. After 1923, it gets tricky. Um, up to, now let me see, I think it's 1923 to 1978. Generally, if they are printed with a copyright symbol and they've been renewed, then you can't use them. But if they were printed without a copyright symbol and they, things were never copyrighted, you might be able to use them. And this, I, I'm not going to go deep into it here because it's, it's kind of a complex subject. But if you're interested in finding information that's in the public domain, this is a great fact. Like it's only one page, but it's kind of in depth. And this is how you find it. I've posted the URL there. So you can really go deep into copyright. So basically before 1923, you can probably use that material. Between 1923 and 1978, it gets more complicated and you have to do your homework, but it's possible. The, the gist of it is you go to the Library of Congress, you can go there online and you can look up a particular book and find out whether it's still in copyright. And this page explains how to do that. So I've given you the URL. So if you wanna go deeper in that, you can totally do that. And there's lots of tools out there for finding public domain information. Google Books is just one of them. And I'll show you guys, oops, I just lost my screen share. Let me go back to my screen share. Okay, this, I want to show you guys this resource quickly. This is an academic source, but it has a whole bunch of historical research tools in here. And you can see like it's everything, the French Revolution to September the 11th, like there's, there's a lot of, and, and here's the thing with history, like history can be really, really serious and very emotional and very important. And it can be kind of funny, like if you go back far enough, it can be funny. So here's another tool just for finding ideas through history here. And I'm going to show you this one as well. And this one I love. This is Echo, which is exploring and collecting history online. Now, what I like about this one, and we can do like browse by historic period. Then this site is where I actually found the 4,000 women or 4,000 years of women in science. What I like about this one is it has very specific areas of interest so for example you can find like ancient medicine and something like this like ancient medicine you know i can probably search there and search medicine we'll see if it works okay there we go national library of medicine exhibitions like you can use these in a lot of ways if you were making band-aids for example or or like your own kind of I don't know, like a tin, a first aid tin for your kitchen or a cabinet that you want to hand. Do, do Americans have first aid cabinets? All British people, right? This was like a thing when I was a kid. All British people have a first aid cabinet and they have like a cupboard on the wall. And when I was a kid, it used to have a red cross on it just so that you knew that if like you fell over outside and you scuffed your finger, that you could go to the first aid cabinet and you could get a band-aid stick on your finger. So if you are making something like this or some kind of like medical themed product or tissues, for example, a box of tissues, you could go and find, like how funny would that be? If you make tissues and you find like pictures of plague doctors and you put that on your tissues, now, and this is what I'm saying about like, history can be kind of serious or it can be kind of funny. And some of it's just time. Like if you go back a few years, history often not funny, very, very serious. You go back to like the 1600s and it's all witches and plague and medieval things. It's kind of funny. So you can take like that idea of like plague doctors, put them on like t tissues, like Kleenex, and that would probably be kind of a gag gift for someone who's sick, like a don't let the plague get you. And I mean, you could go all out on that and make a bundle with it. And someone asked earlier whether I was talking about private labeling products or bundling already branded products. Kind of both. I think this is veering more towards white label, but you could totally, I'm, I'm sure there is someone out there who will customize 
a box or a packet of tissues for you and you could create like a little get well pack that's themed around 1600s and the black death because that's the kind of friend you would be you would want to send that to your friend who's got a cold so it, like you, you can kind of take these funny things from history and use these in your <laughs> bring out your dead there you go bring out your dead first aid kit so okay let me move on okay so we did the engrams uh, we did uh, we were looking for history memes i think I've kind of covered most of those things. Let me stop my share and look at my notes there. Okay, so what what have we talked about? We've talked about people. That's the first thing. In history, history is all about people. And people have interests, obsessions, they, do, they have specific occupations. And these are things that apply now and they applied in history. And comparisons are a huge, huge thing. Like, I, for some reason, we're really drawn to comparisons. We're like, well, what would have happened? And Isaac talks to me, he, he, he loves the Flintstones. He's all about like, how he, what he likes about Flintstones is like, well, how would the Flintstones do a car? Okay, so they have the big stone wheels and they pedal it like this. How would someone in this era do a <laughs> Nader says I love the Flintstones too. How would someone in this particular era deal with a modern problem? And I, I think this is where you get into the real humor with history and with historic things. It's like just comparing, like, mo like when you take funny sentences or, or funny current trends. Like, I don't know, dubstep music or trap music or, or something like that. And then you apply that to like a picture of Beethoven or Mozart. You get into this kind of like, you, you, you can find these comparisons. You're like, oh, this person was a musical genius or this person was big into bling or like, and, and you can find these comparisons. I don't know. Can anyone think of any? I'm kind of just talking about comparisons of what people do now with what people might have done 200 years ago or 300 years ago like i don't know you could look at modern issues or modern problems and like if you want to take a political stance you could be like okay what would people in the 1800s what would people in the civil war feel about like texting uh, yes exactly thank you diana text uh, texting alexander graham bell so you have alexander graham bell and he's like looking at his texts oh i don't know you could put it on a phone case with like some gag about making a call or yeah that like that's exactly it you you compare or or like i i don't know who else did you have i'm trying to think of some like historical figures <laughs> he's like are you there like yeah what are, what are other text gags i mean if you imagine like having alexander bell and he's doing all the text speak and the omg lol brb like that's that's exactly it you can start applying these old concepts to new products and new ideas and you know history goes a lot of ways there's nostalgia there's emotion i mean like people can be very nostalgic about things some people want to go back to like the 1940s or the 1920s, they kind of romanticize those eras. Some people romanticize like the 1800s and that whole gone with the wind thing. And what you do is, if, if you're interested in one of those time periods, like look at where the intersects are with current events or current fashions. And I, I think this is kind of a challenge. Like what are some trends at the moment? Has anyone got ideas for kind of what are trending topics at the moment like I know like bicycles are a big thing like hipster bicycles so you get people like looking up penny farthings and I mean like let's say you had um you wanted to make a product like bicycle bags what what accessories go with your bike like a pump like oh people wear those um like vests for bicycling what if you take like the concept of penny farthings and kind of put those images on it um or get some text like maybe someone had a quote about how dangerous penny farthings were in the 1800s and let's say someone said okay penny farthings are the most dangerous machine ever to be made and bicycling is a terrible idea and will never catch on and then you take that quote and you put it on a bike helmet like this is how you can use 
history to really find the material, the pictures, the text, the concepts that you can put onto something current. DIY things, cute baskets, playing cards. You know, that's funny, Jordan. I, Isaac and I were talking about that the other day, putting cards in the spokes on your bike. And now they have like this machine that you can put on your bike that makes it sound like a motorbike. Going, rum, rum, rum. Like that's, that's perfect. Like if you get someone who's a bike enthusiast, then send them, like you can make a greetings card with a picture of a guy on a penny farthing and then some quote about like something about, I, I don't know, is that they're, they're like BMXing? What do people do now? They ride those like crazy bikes with the big fat wheels. Like what if you took a current quote about someone talking about the big fat wheels full of jargon about those and then um, superimposed it over a picture of a penny farthing. Um, ukuleles, oh my gosh, really? Is that a thing? Uh, penny farthings are bikes. They were like the bikes in the 1800s. So they had one really big wheel at the front and then a little wheel at the back. Super dangerous. Loads of people like died falling off them on their heads. <laughs> Ukuleles, that's awesome. That's, that's like, so, I mean, if, if that's a trend now, then I bet you could go back and find loads of classic pictures or music of people playing ukuleles. And what can you do to bring those pictures or that music up to date? What can you do with it that would make it kind of interesting now? I mean, again, you could do greetings cards, you could do gift wrap. And again, we're going back to thinking of target audience. So you're making products for a modern audience. You're making products for an audience that are into current trends. But what you're doing is going back and finding history that's relevant to them. And I, I mean, I think there's a lot of like hairstyles. That's not, I mean, we talked about beards and we talked about mustaches, but there's this lady that does hairstyles and her whole thing is doing historical hairstyles for women. And she does like Greek hairstyles. Like they're, they're absolutely stunning. Um, and I think it's it's a gold mine of places. Like if you had a hair salon or you're making a range of hair products, um, then what about like Medusa hair products? Like Medusa was famous for having the snake hair, for having the crazy snakes coming out of her hair and she could like turn you to stone with her hair. Um, go back and find some beautiful public domain images of Medusa and have your Medusa hairstyle range and be like, this will turn your prom date to stone um, and start merging those concepts. Have a picture of like, get someone to draw it. What would happen if Medusa went to the prom? How would that look? What would happen? Like there's your website or your picture or your marketing campaign. Victory rolls. Oh my gosh, KD, so do I. Victory rolls are awesome. Like that whole 1940s, like the, the beautiful victory rolls look, that's been huge. And, you know, I was showing um, the niche machine from Blue Sky Suite at the beginning. Let me see if I can go back to that and bring that um, back up. But let me go to Blue Sky Suite. Okay, so I was in the niche machine and we went to hairstyles, which is fashion and beauty, hairstyles. Okay, so what you can do, I mean, like we can see here, pixie cut. So 165,000 people a month look for pixie cut on Google. That probably means there's a lot of girls getting pixie cuts right now. I could, I, I think you could just put a picture of a really cute girl with a pixie cut on a pencil case, on a lunch box, on a, a makeup bag, and put pixie cut and use that keyword pixie cut and you would probably have a product that could sell. Mohawk. I mean, mohawks are always popular. 135,000 people looking for mohawks. Another 135,000 looking for pompadour. Like, these are things you can find public domain images, artwork, how-tos. You could find a guide how to do a pompadour hairstyle, how to do the perfect pixie cut. And if we go back in history, I mean, you could do how to get victory rolls and I bet you there are some great old books guides information on how to do victory rolls or pictures or diagrams that you could bring and put and you could put into a, a modern product <laughs> how to do the comb over I love it Molly um yeah Katie says is this going to be available later 
I'm not sure if we are doing, we may do, I don't know. I don't know if we're doing a public replay with this. What I'm probably going to do is put this into create with all the chat. So my problem is if I put this on YouTube, I can't include the chat. But if I put it into create, we can put the chat in it and we can also uh, put all the resources. And I've got a whole list of resources of where you can find public domain information, where you can find more discussions about history and so on. Another thing I've been using and create people, you'll like this. If I go to Sky Tools, um, you can actually use Skywords for coming up with ideas. So, for example, we could look up uh, Victorian and do a search on Victorian. Um, and you could probably do this with keywords, with Google keyword search if you don't have uh, Skywords. But look, here, here are some ideas of what people are actually, whoops, I clicked that one, of what people are actually looking for that's Victorian. Victorian dress, Victorian jewelry, furniture, decor, locket. Like making a locket, getting lockets custom made isn't very difficult. There's a lot of people out there that you could get to make a custom locket for you. And look up Victorian styles of lockets. You could, if you're not feeling creative, you could probably copy one from an old book, from an 1800s book or an 1800s image and use that to make a new Victorian locket. We can see here a lot of people are searching for this. The darker the color, the more people are searching for this. Victorian hat, Victorian costume. Funny story, when I was eight years old, my grandmother dressed me up as a Victorian because there's like, there's an old market in Guernsey, which is where I'm from, and they had a Victorian market. Yes, Laurie, we, yes, you can find many of them in the Blue Sky Directory. I think there's 50 suppliers in the Blue Sky Directory at the moment, and I'm gonna be adding more to that really soon. Victorian tear catchers. Jordan says, one thing I've always wanted to do is Victorian tear catchers. That sounds awesome, I don't know what that is. Some other ideas, I'm sure he's gonna explain in a minute. Um, Victorian underwear, Victorian couch, Victorian jacket. Fabric, Victorian fabric. Again, fabric is another thing to get made very, very easily. And guys, you don't have to go to China to get stuff made. You can go, just Google wholesale custom uh, fabric. Absolutely, Laurie, it would totally help. Uh, Laurie's asking, would it help to know what we wanted to make so we could add supplies? Yes, if you, if you tell me what products you're interested in making, I will help you find suppliers and we can add them to the directory. That's definitely something I want to do. So John says, Victorian tear catchers were when someone you loved died, you would catch your tears in a glass vial. And a year after they passed, oh my gosh, this is so morbid, you go back to their grave and pour your tears over the grave to symbolize the love you have for them oh my gosh and you have a year of mourning that's wow i'm i'm so sad i can't that's great jordan i love it victorian tear tear catches wow they were so morbid <laughs> molly's saying oh my gosh those victorians so i mean victorian we can see this is a huge thing look how many people are searching for victorian things i mean you could do something else you can do like civil war like okay civil war sort uh, civil war marvel's big at the moment civil war costume fabric again like custom fabric is a big big thing like there are so many ideas for historical like things that people are interested in another source of things and i i, I want to talk about something quickly here another awesome source is what are people watching on tv at the moment like outlander is huge right now outlander is like it's i i don't know i haven't watched it it's all scottish i know it's scottish um and so i'm guessing it's people in kilts and saying okay and like stabbing people with swords and getting in fights and chip shops and uh, that's I, I went into my like Scottish people. I, I love Scottish people. They're awesome. I, I'm, I'm English kind of. Outlander. Okay, Sheila just mentioned Outlander. <laughs> it's I, I'm so lost. I Karen, I didn't mean it. I love Scottish people. I went to Edinburgh. And it's a wonderful place. Oh my gosh, I've just offended everyone that's Scottish now. I love you Scottish people. I was joking. You don't all get in fights in chip shops. I love you really. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so Outlander, right, is all about the old Scottish thing. Before that, 
there was Braveheart. Okay, so like this isn't a new thing. People getting into like Scottish history. You had out, like Outlander and Braveheart, and oh my gosh, I love you guys. I was joking. Oh, you're all wonderful. I love you. I love Laurie. I love Irish people. I love Scottish people. I love you all very much. It was a joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay so all right so we go back oh my gosh you're kidding okay um, we're all friends we all group hug loved you highlander yes that was another one so you had braveheart and you had highlander and here's the thing like you don't need to tread on any um infringements you don't need to tread on any intellectual property infringements because like these are historical concepts and you can go back and use any kind of Scottish thing you like. And the fact that Outlander is so popular brings that whole Celtic, Scottish, Gaelic, whatever thing. Like it's huge right now. You can have, people are having like Scottish weddings, Celtic weddings, kilts. You could put anything on a kilt. You could put images on a kilt and think about that intersect. Is there anything you could put on a kilt? Let, actually, let me um, run a keyword search on kilt because I think that might be interesting. Um, and while that's running, I'll keep talking. But you could put a, a lot of different things. Let me, okay, Rosa's asking, Catherine, if you have an idea for a private or a white label, do you go on Google or Amazon and check to see if there's interest before you produce your product? That's a really, really good question. Um, okay, if you have an idea for a product, do you research to see whether there's interest before you produce your product? Yeah, I think it's always a good idea. Personally, I use Skywords, but I also use Google Keyword Planner. And I love that tool, I use it all the time. Google Keyword Planner is the most accurate search volume you can get. Bear this in mind, there are keyword, there's keyword software out there, Claims to have a search volume from Amazon, it does not. The most accurate place to get keyword data is from Google Keyword Planner. So I use Skywords and I use Google Keyword Planner to check how many searches there are for a particular product or a particular keyword. And I think that's great research to do that. However, oh and actually I also look at Amazon to see um, how similar products are doing. Um, just to give me an idea. Although that can be a bit misleading because people set up bad listings and they don't have good keywords. So often it will look like something's not selling on Amazon, but it's not because it's a bad product. It's because the seller has done a bad um, job of putting keywords in there. So I will look at those things to get an idea of how a product will do. But ultimately, if I think I have a really good idea for a product and I really believe in it and I'm gonna make it, um, and it's something that emotionally appeals to me, I have a pretty good feeling that other people will like that product too. And if it's unique, then like there may be no history for it because no one else has made that product or come up with that idea yet. Um, and I, I think that's a confidence issue. A lot of people are like, well, I'm, I'm not gonna make a new product because no one else has done it, so it's probably a bad idea. No, don't think that way. If you have a unique idea for a product, awesome, awesome. The world needs unique product ideas. If you have a unique product idea, try it. If you can try it without spending a fortune on it and betting the farm on it, try it. Please, please try it. Because what you can do is you can use um, Facebook, you can use all kinds of social media, you can use Pinterest, and if there isn't a trend already, you can create a trend. You can make a Facebook page for it, you can share it with your friends, you can share it on Pinterest. Um, you can kind of push these things and create a trend. So don't be afraid of coming up with something new or trying something new. Yes, do your research, and if you see that there's already like popular searches for it, great. But don't be put off too much if you don't find anything. There was another question, let me go back. Kilts on skirts. I had an idea for jewelry. You could buy for a dollar from Cool Jewelry Supplier and sell for $5 each. Yes, five to $10 each. Um, AliExpress, AliExpress has a lot of things. I love that, Rick. Rick says, be the trend, absolutely. 
AliExpress has a lot of stuff with cheap jewelry. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to go the overseas route, if you're, if you're really interested in the overseas thing and, and buying from Alibaba, test it with AliExpress first. You can order in small quantities from AliExpress. Definitely a good idea to test things out first and really know what you're going, really know what you're doing before you go deep. I've seen too many people lose money going big on Alibaba. So I'm kind of focused on US suppliers. But definitely, if you're going to go overseas, look at AliExpress because you can get really cheap products from there first. And also be very careful of the quality. Be very careful of the safety. Like you don't want to get things that little children can choke on or that's made of lead or anything like that. Um, I'm just going to share this with you really quickly because we talked about kilt and I just did a keyword search for kilt. Um, and I can show you Blue Sky Suite came up with a few things. So kilt belt. Oh my gosh, this is really small. I think my, um, I need to make my screen a bit bigger so I can read it. Um, oh, I need my eyes tested. Um, a kilt pin. This is kind of cool. So kilt pins, um, that's one of the most searched for things. Kilt bucket, buckle, kilt pattern. Um, I don't know what a kilt lifter is. That just scares me. Highland dancing kilt, kilt extender. So what I would think here is things like a kilt pin and a kilt belt, this is your opportunity for an intersect. This is where you can say, okay, what can I put on my kilt? And someone said TARDIS, like that's such a fantastic idea. I mean, like you kind of have a link there with the whole like geeks love. And I'd say geeks in a very loving way because I, I kind of am a little bit of a geek. But like there's this big crossover between people who like kilts, people who like Doctor Who, you have the Peter Capaldi being Scottish, Link, like that's kind of a thing. So you could have like Doctor Who kilt pins. I'm not recommending that because Doctor Who is a uh, intellectual property, so you can't use that. But I think you could probably come up with some sort of time traveling concept or some kind of generic version of that. I'm going to stop my screen share, come back here. Yeah. To, oh, and David Tennant was Scottish as well, although he had an English accent in as the Doctor. So while the actor was Scottish, Character, not so much. Kilt socks. So you can put pictures of kilts on socks. So lots and lots of ideas there. I was going to just say something else and I've forgotten what it was I was going to say. Oh, in Skywords, what is the difference between inspirations and hot searches? So the inspirations are more product focused. Inspirations are just being drawn from marketplaces, online marketplaces and stores. The hot searches are coming from a variety of search engines and marketplaces. So it's um, the, the uh, inspirations is really good for coming up with product ideas. The hot searches is good for coming up with keywords and trends. But actually, I mean, you can kind of use both. It, it kind of depends on the product, what results you get. So it's worth looking at both of them and using both of them. And there was another thing I wanted to mention. <laughs> How much coffee do you drink a day? You know, I've actually been cutting down on coffee. I've, I've had one cup of coffee today and I've had two days with no coffee. So I've been, I've been going slow on coffee. Yes, intersect, there's a goth element in the kilted community. And uh, yeah, in, in my um, younger goth days, like it was a big thing. People were wearing like PVC kilts, vinyl kilts. Like it's kind of a, a big thing. Here's, here's what's cool with this. Like with this whole concept, you can do any kind of product. And what I would suggest, and this is what I've been saying with white label, is start really small. Think about a really simple product. Look at people's needs. Go around your house and look at the products you use. What are the most simple products in your house? Your dog bowl, like what are your pet bowl? Bathroom scales, shower curtains, towels, I don't know, calendars, gift tags, gift wrap. Think about very simple products in your house. Now, a lot of those are boring. Your pets, I bet your dog bowl is boring. I bet it's like a boring dog bowl. And if you put something cute on it, like you put characters on it or some idea on it, um, you could like sell a lot of them. Jordan's mule mugs are amazing. Jordan came up with Moscow mule mugs that are absolutely beautiful if you're making Moscow mules. But look around your house and see see what products you have that meet people's needs. And I've been I've been riffing on the wooden spoons for a while. I mean like wooden spoons, everyone has wooden spoons and they're always boring. 
Why do we have boring wooden spoons? Why do we have boring shower curtains? You can have anything you want printed on a shower curtain. Why do we all have boring shower curtains? I'm sure someone's gonna pop up and be like, well, actually I have like a zombie murder scene on my shower curtain. Um, and Jordan probably does, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> but just look at the boring products around your house. Okay, now look for something interesting. Like what intersects well with dogs? Look at your dog bowl. Okay, what intersects well with dogs? Dogs are animals. Hound of the Baskervilles, boom. Put the Hound of the Baskervilles on your dog's bowl. And I'm pretty sure Hand of the Baskervilles is in the public domain. And so you could probably find an illustration and some text from that. Put it on your doggy's bowl. Boom, you have a product. Like it's a very straightforward way of, of doing this. And what's amazing now is that there is so much room for customized products. Someone asked about Amazon Custom. Let me go back to that question. What was that? Can you add pictures to products yourself or do you have to be approved and handmade to do that? So what I'm suggesting is using FBA and having products made for you that you can send to FBA. I am not suggesting using, Amazon Custom is a different thing. Um, Amazon Custom is pretty much if you are a printer, personally, I would not worry about either handmade or custom. Um, handmade, like handmade is kind of for people who like Etsy. Um, it's nice because it showcases you as an artisan. It comes up with a picture and says, this is Molly, she makes beautiful things. Um, here's a lovely necklace. And it's kind of a good way of, if, if you make necklaces or jewelry or something that's cute and handmade and you want to really emphasize the fact it's handmade, then go with handmade. It, custom is if you are a printer, if you are an embroiderer, if you do engraving and you want to make customized products for people, that's custom. Neither of them are particularly helpful if you're an FBA seller and you like being an FBA seller and you want to keep being an FBA seller. So what I'm personally suggesting, I mean, those are fine business models, but they're very different business models from FBA. What I'm suggesting is get your products made. And there are a lot of print on demand companies. There are a lot of US suppliers and manufacturers that will happily customize a product for you. At ASD, we saw a lot of companies that said, we will private label our spices or our hot sauce or our, I don't know, our pencils or whatever for you. Um, you can go to them and actually work with them to brand a product. That's what I'm suggesting. Get your product branded, put custom artwork on it, put a UPC on it, package it, like put it in a nice box and then sell it on Amazon FBA. And Test it, test small quantities. And this is what's amazing now. There are a lot of websites where you can get small quantities made and test it out in small quantities. It may be more expensive to get it made in small quantities, but test it. And once you have a successful product and you're like, I've proven this concept, it works, people want it, boom, you can expand. And what's glorious about this, like really glorious about this, is it's your product. No one can tread on your toes here. This is your product. Yes, there are US fabric and towel makers, the shower curtain makers, there's all kinds out there. Just do a Google on wholesale custom fabric and I'm sure you will find plenty of people or, or fabric printers and there will be lots of them out there. Guys, if you find anything cool that you want to add to the directory, please, please do. If you want me to look anything in particular up for you, please let me know. I'm going to give a quick shout out to the new course. It's at blueskysuite.com. It's all about white label. If you're interested in what we've been talking about in this video um, or in this class, then go check out blueskysuite.com. We have a new course, it's 15 hours of content. Kay's asking, would you try to register your brand with Amazon? Um, brand registry is another subject. Um, I, can, I can talk about brand registry very, very quickly. Um, brand registry is kind of overrated in some ways. A lot of people think it offers a lot of protection that it doesn't. Basically, brand registry gives you ownership over your listings. So you create the listing and other people can't make changes to that listing. It doesn't, doesn't stop people listing against you. Um, but it does give you more sway with Amazon if someone like comes on your listing selling improper products, Amazon may pay you a little bit more attention. But actually, you can get people off your listing even if you're not through the brand registry. And I've done it myself. I've had, um, I've sold like gift baskets 
And I've had other people jump on board selling fake gift baskets. Um, and all Amazon want you to do is do a test buy from that person and prove that the product you received is not um, the same as the product you listed and they will remove that person. So you don't need brand registry for that, but brand registry is not a bad idea if you um, are building your own brand on Amazon, just because it does give you more control over the listing and it stops people from messing with your photographs or your description. So I recommend brand registry, but it's not essential. Cool, okay, I think hopefully you've got a lot of ideas flowing. I'm gonna post resources with this. I've got a whole list of uh, URLs and resources that I've used sort of in researching this class um, and we're going to post it definitely as part of the create course with the chat with the resources I might post it on YouTube I haven't decided yet I'm not sure whether we're going to do that or not um, but thank you so much everybody who joined us it's been a lot of fun I'm really excited about this year and where we're all going with our new products and our new brands awesome on the haircut Karen thank you so much everyone have a great afternoon bye